Of course, the framers were not naive, naively optimistic, which is why they entrusted the federal government and the justice system with the task of preserving the constitutional rights of the minority against the unwarranted oppression of the majority, and why they decided on a constitutional republic rather than a pure democracy, where such populist tendencies often manifested themselves. But, sociologically speaking, the body of the Constitution can be seen as the manifest will of the people, and in upholding the dignity of man and its principles spells out a definite conception of human nature. This conception, I hold, came to an end with the theories of Freud and psychoanalysis, and later with Skinner and the behaviorists, and our legal system, or more broadly our social system, has never been the same since. A sociologist may spend volumes discussing Freud's impact on the 20th century. Adam Curtis did so very succinctly in his A Century of the Self. But suffice it to say here, his conception of man is being driven by fundamentally irrational impulses and animal instincts, buried in a kind of reservoir in the unconscious, only superficially and precariously by the artificial constructs of civilization, appealed equally to the fascists on the one hand, who never trusted mass democracies in the first place, and the propagandists and the industrialists on the other, who saw that dreams were not only a royal road to the unconscious, but also to the pocketbooks and the ballot boxes. No longer did people have to be convinced by the preponderance of evidence and logic and rational debates. They could be appealed to more directly on a deeper level by an endless parade of sexual fantasies and para paranoid nightmare scenarios. Edward Bernays, the father of public relations, was a master of just such a craft, and sold it not only to the Nazis, but also to those who would later exploit the burgeoning mass consumerism of the United States to render infinite affection for the same old assembly line goods. This was done in the kind of totemic, mythic, fetishistic fashion that came so natural to Freudian analysis and which was so transparently brought to light in McLuhan's Mechanical Bride, the folklore of industrial man. Further, since man could no longer be trusted because he was a raving lunatic just beneath the surface, it follows that certain measures would have to be taken in order to make sure that he did not panic or go astray. His speech, for example, would have to be curbed in the case of a clear and present danger, or in the case of sedition, which even if it was the only means of saving the Republic, even if the only means of saving the Republic was in fact to overthrow the government. He would have to re be reminded of his patriotic and religious duties. God would henceforth be inserted into the Pledge of Allegiance and the dollar bill in case he irrationally gave in to the shadowy schemes of the Communists. Since he was inherently selfish, Charity would henceforth be forced out of him at the point of a gun, with his income appropriated to the right sectors and institutions we, which he would otherwise neglect. He cannot be entrusted with paving his own roads, much less taking care of his own health or the health of his community, for that matter. Certain preventative measures would have to be taken as well, to protect him from taking his own life or, for, or from perverting it to, to an extreme. He would be banned from ingesting certain substances, from seeing certain images. He would have to wear a seatbelt. What is more, he is ruining the environment and having too many children. He is a plague upon the earth, a cancer. His efforts would have to be made to reduce his numbers as well as his carbon footprint. Now, of course, much of this was done in the guise of protecting the workers from capitalist exploitation. But the case could be made and in the libertarian analysis has been made that this enthusiastic faith in regulation and redistribution only led to a further and more dangerous exploitation, that of the state, where capitalist motives for profit give way to imperialist and murderous ones. Or rather, the most dangerous impulses of each were given free reign in their all too comfortable reciprocity. Not only that, such a transfer of power and sovereignty grossly underestimates the power of workers to freely associate and spontaneously unite to make their demands directly at the corporate doorsteps without all the obscure machinations and colluding intrigues of bureaucracy which only lead to a further fattening of the central banking coffers and the military industrial war machines. Our, our wealth, rather than being redistributed, redistributed, was consolidated, all in the name of protecting the workers. What a farce. 
So it was that the social engineers took over and the dignity of man was replaced by the fractured soft portraits leaning on their support structures and Dali's surrealist portraitures. The platonic guardians and their infinite illuminated wisdom knew better. They could save us from ourselves. In fact, they could save the planet, even though in the final analysis the planet will be here long after us and it is human beings who need saving from each other. They were, after all, at the top of the pyramid and they had history on their side. The history of tyrants, aristocrats, and monarchs, that is. Thus, our represent representatives became mere representations. People relied on the private sector to keep them fat and happy, and they relied on the state to take care of just about everything else. And in this all-too-convenient partnership, both were allowed to take over in the most unholy of alliances. The private sector would no longer feed the appetites of the masses, but create them. And the state would no longer protect the inherent natural rights of the people, but rather delegate to them certain liberties, deemed useful to the national interest. No man is born with these liberties, rather he acquires them at the behest of the state in exchange for its complementary nannying and policing, i.e. if the state gives you everything, it also has the right to tell you to do anything. Henceforth, human beings are no longer innocent until proven guilty. Until you prove otherwise, you are the communist or the terrorist. Until you prove otherwise, you are the crazy one. The insanity defends par excellence. The benefit of the doubt in this case goes to the state. In all this talk about human freedom, one of two possibilities is assumed. Either human beings are free or not free, and we must legislate accordingly. But what needs to be discussed more urgently, if we understand the social construction of reality co correctly, is the question of how freedom is created, or whether it should be created, if indeed it is the case that it is absent at the beginning. Clearly, Freud's vision of man is not conducive to the kind of freedom spelled out in the Constitution, but seems almost inevitably to lead to the iron cage of bureaucracy. If we would create the kind of creature upheld in the dignity of man, it is precisely this tendency which must be guarded against. In the end, charity must once again be privatized, and we must ask the central question, as our Isaiah Berlin did before us, not only freedom from what, but freedom for what. We should ask this que second question, moreover, without falling prey to that single source of so much zealous genocide in the previous century, the ideology that the end justifies the means. That is to say, if the man or woman walking across the street chooses in good faith and conscience to let the poor mother starve with her children in the gutter, or the corporation to swallow up every drop and jot of the commonwealth, let him or her, her do so at their own peril. But according to this doctrine, we shall not only assume that their better nature will persuade them in the end, we shall be there doing the persuading. For it is only persuasion, not coercion, that wins the human heart. Coercion can only force the hand, but if the hand is divided from the agency that guides it, it will find a way to backhand the mouth it feeds on every occasion. Thus, anarchy loosed upon the world in this way, if its monopolistic and populist tendencies be properly reined in by our signed and sworn principles, sworn principles, will mean the liberation of engagement and empathy in every citizen. Let every citizen, let, or let everyone with a consciousness to see clearly, make sure to increase the alien light of the world, where neither the regulations of special interest cronies nor the deductions of lying warmongers will suffice. Who needs the FCC? Let's become the media. Corporate monopolies? As consumers, we hold the power of their starvation. Let the educators educate and the philosophers philosophize. For it is only through free association and voluntary mutual aid that human beings really come to know each other by name, not just by rank or rote. It is, only, it is the only way they learn the true value of their labor and what is at stake if they do not knock, knock loudly directly at the corporate door. It is the only way the representations become representatives once more. The spectacle subsides, the feds withdraw, and behold, we build our own communes, we spread out our own safety net, we farm our own lands, we open up our own schools. Suddenly everyone has everything to lose. It makes us feel the earth beneath our feet again. First there is panic, but directly thereafter is something we haven't seen for generations. Action. Angry, trembling, sobbing, yes, but action.